welcome to the first AMA and thanks for submitting all your questions. Uh, let's go through them one by one. Uh, so let's start with microservices. So there are a few questions about asking about how to learn more about microservices. And the two resources that I would recommend are these. The first one is the book Building Microservices by Sam Newman. It's an excellent book about theoretical concepts of microservices. And there are also a few videos by Sam Newman on YouTube. You can check them out. The other resource is Martin Fowler's article about microservices. Another question about microservices is what is a microservice? How do you define it? And I'm sure there are many of us who have the same question. So let's try to understand that with an example. So let's say we have a small startup, like only four or five developers working on it. And it's an e-commerce application where we'll list the products. Uh, there'll be functionalities about adding items to the cart, uh, making the order, making the payments. So all the code for these functionalities, let's say are in a single repository. Okay. Since it's a new app, there'll be very few classes there. So it's very small and manageable. Let's say slowly the application becomes popular and you grow in size. Now, instead of three or four developers, you have 15 developers and you split the team into small sizes, each working on a single feature. And each of these teams want to add no new features to your application. For example, products team might want to introduce trending products, sponsored products, or listing advertisements to the, the payments team could be thinking about adding features for fraud detection or ability to have discounts. So let's say all 15 members of your team are adding all these features together as part of single JIT repository and deploying it as part of a single deployment that is, there is a single war file or a single jar file being deployed to a server. So now you have to have immense coordination amongst all these teams. Whenever you do check-ins, whenever you create branches, it is more likely to have some integration issues. So one problematic code check-in by one team is going to cause the entire JIT repo to fail in the continuous integration. And more importantly, there is no isolation when this application is deployed onto the server. So let's say as part of the recent release, there was some problematic code that was deployed as part of the payment functionality. And that code is occupying a lot of threads or let's say it's occupying a lot of memory due to which there is an exception out of memory exception and the whole application crashes. So even though the problem was only in the payment feature, none of the other features were accessible by the user because it was all deployed, all the code was deployed as part of a single unit of deployment. So there is no fault isolation between functionalities when you have a monolith. So one way to address all these issues about team communication and uh, fault isolation is to separate all these functionalities out into their own applications. And each of these applications is now called a microservice. And now since each team is working on its own microservice, each team can work on its own repo. Each team can use its own language, its own database. And any problems in one service will not affect any other service. So for example, if the payment microservice goes down, you can still show the product listings and personalization, and you can still allow users to add items to the cart. Typically, you should start your application as a monolith. And when it grows too large, and when you have a big team, and you start having these problems, only then you should split it into multiple microservices. So the next question is about implementing microservices, authentication and authorization two parts of the system where you want to introduce auth. One is between the client and microservice and one is between two microservices. If you want to implement authentication between the client and the microservice where your client can be either a web UI or an Android app or an iOS app, 
I would recommend using Firebase libraries. It allows you to implement OAuth 2. So you can add buttons like sign in with Google or sign in with Facebook and so on and so forth. Firebase SDK will take care of redirecting the user to these sign on pages, ensuring the user has logged in. And then for every subsequent request to the service, it will send a token. And in the microservice in the back end, you can use the Firebase libraries, which are available in many languages like Java, PHP, Python, and so on to get that token and validate. Other way to do this is to configure an API gateway. So if, if you're using any cloud provider like AWS, AWS API gateway already has functionality to just configure your OAuth into it. And it will ensure that any request that comes through that API gateway to any of the microservices behind the scenes will have to be authenticated. If they are not, the API gateway will redirect the users to the correct sign-in pages. A similar standalone component which helps with authentication authorization is called Keycloak. Uh, do check it out, it's a Red Hat project. It's quite popular. And finally, you can also directly implement Spring Security in your microservice, which also has these options of storing your own users' email IDs and encrypted passwords and storing their authorization roles and so on and so forth. Uh, but personally, I've found this to be more complicated than it needs to be. Uh, the second part is having authentication between two microservices to ensure that the calling microservice is authorized to call the other microservice. And in the spring world, honestly, I don't know if there are any projects which allow that. Uh, but if you are using Cl Cloud Foundry, there are definitely policies that you can set up. And if you're using Kubernetes to deploy your uh, services, uh, then lately they have introduced this service mesh concept of Istio, where they also give you the admin UI to configure which microservice can talk to which other microservice. Okay, the next question is to understand how to use Zool and Eureka together and how to spin up new instances if the load increases on a single instance. So Spring Boot has this actuator project which tells you how much load there is on a particular service, but I don't know how would you connect that to ensure that there are multiple copies of the instances and then shut down those instances when there are not those many requests. But you can do this very easily, the spinning up and spinning down. Uh, if you are using any cloud provider or even Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes. Okay, about the Zool and Eureka. So as per my understanding, Zool is an API gateway. I already have a video about what features API gateway provide. So Eureka is a component by Spring, which provides service discovery. So your microservices will register themselves with Eureka saying that my name is this microservice and this is my IP address. One microservice can discover the IP address of other microservice through this component of Eureka. So next category of questions is concurrency. Let's start with that. So first one is how does a web server handle concurrency? So web servers like Tomcat have a thread pool of a typical size of 200 threads. So for every request, a particular thread is assigned. Uh, the request is served. So the response is sent back to the user and then the thread is free and it can go back to the pool. So it is very similar to an executor service where the request can keep coming in and as long as threads are free, they are assigned to that particular request. And if all threads are full, then that request will go into a request queue. And that's why the number of concurrent requests that your web server can handle will be completely dependent on the size of your thread pool and how much amount of time each of your request takes to be fulfilled. And that's why this project of Spring Reactive or Spring Web Flux was introduced so that even with minimal number of threads, you can scale up the number of users or number of requests that you can serve simultaneously. The next question is about semaphores, a real life use case for semaphores. And I covered a pattern called bulkhead pattern in my last video. We have, let's say we have a thread pool of size 10 and using the same thread pool, we are calling three external services. So, and we want to restrict only three threads to be able to call the payment service. 
To achieve that, we can use a semaphore. So we can declare the semaphore of size three. So any thread which wants to access the payment service will first acquire the semaphore. So here the semaphore is acquired and that's why the count has now gone from three to two. If there are three simultaneous requests, all three threads will acquire the semaphore and now the count has become zero. Now, if the next thread tries to acquire the semaphore, it will not be able to acquire that semaphore. And that is how you can restrict the maximum number of simultaneous tasks that can be performed using a semaphore. And actually the bulkhead pattern implemented in resilience for J internally actually uses semaphore to achieve the same. So next question is how does a concurrent hash map rehash at the same time when any long running thread is doing some operation on any of the other segments. So internally a concurrent hash map or even a hash map has an array and whenever the size of this array goes beyond the load factor which is typically 0.75 which means that if this array or table as it is called goes beyond 75% occupancy it is doubled in size the array size is doubled. And to allow concurrent operations to happen, the concurrent hash map is divided into multiple segments. So a typical hash map is divided into 16 segments. And each segment has a lock so that one thread accessing one segment do not have to wait other thread accessing some other segment. So the question is, let's say there are two threads. One is accessing segment one and the other is accessing segment three and the table size is full. Now both these threads will have to go into wait state or basically they'll have to wait until this entire array is doubled in size. And internally, concurrent hash map does not have a single table. Each of those segments is actually an individual hash table. And each of those individual hash tables has its own load factor. And if that segment one let's say is occupied for more than 75%, only that particular segment is doubled in size. So if you have 16 segments, in a concurrent hash map, there are 16 tables or 16 arrays inside it. And when any of the segments gets full, only that segment array is doubled in size. And that's why we do not have this issue of having all the threads to wait for doubling the table. So the next question is how do you use completable future with a spring rest controller to improve the performance? And the short answer is you cannot. If you're using spring rest controller, where you have a request coming in, you have to do some operation and then you send the response. For that amount of time where you're doing the processing of the request, that thread will have to wait. Now that processing you can do directly on the same thread or you can do in an executor service or you can do in a completable future, it will not matter. Because the request thread of the servlet thread pool, which is the thread pool used by Spring REST controller, will have to wait until there is a response to be sent. Unless you're using Spring Web Flux, which is reactive in nature, and in, only in that case, you can use the reactive functionality of completable future to move things along faster. The next question is, let's say you have a file with a million records. We want to get the record from the file, call an IO service, update the database and write the response value back to the file. And you have a million such records. What is the optimal way to achieve that? Both calling the database and the REST API is an IO bound operation. So whatever thread you use will be waiting for that IO operation to complete most of the time. So you can have a fixed thread pool of a very large size. You should not worry about how many CPU cores you have because your operations are not CPU bound, they are IO bound. And in a while loop, you just keep fetching the records from the file, create a runnable task, which takes that file, calls the database and the IO and submit that to the executor. Once submitted, we call the shutdown to the executor which will not stop the executor. It will allow it to shut down. This is like a graceful shutdown method. And then you should wait for the particular amount of time for your whole processing to be completed. 
द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज वॉट इज सीरियलाइजेशन एंड डिसरियलाइजेशन गिव सम रियल लाइफ एग्जाम्पल्स सो सीरियलाइजेशन इज अ वे टू स्टोर योर जावा ऑब्जेक्ट्स ऑन टू द डिस्क और टू सेंड इट ओवर द नेटवर्क टू सम अदर सर्विस वी डोंट नीड टू स्टोर जावा ऑब्जेक्ट्स और डोंट नीड टू सीरियलाइज जावा ऑब्जेक्ट्स इन टू देर बाइनरी फॉर्मेट्स एनी मोर सो वी इवन स्प्रिंग बाई डिफॉल्ट विल कन्वर्ट योर जावा ऑब्जेक्ट इन टू जेस ऑन ऑब्जेक्ट बिफोर सेंडिंग इट आउट एज अ रिस्पॉन्स टू द क्लाइंट एंड एज अ डेवलपर आई थिंक यू शुड नॉट इवन फोकस ऑन इट Okay a lot of you have requested new videos so i have a request for abstract queue synchronizer this is quite a dense subject in terms of java concurrency and i have read this paper from dugley who created that class i would suggest you read this paper i do not have any plans right now to create a video about it but i might in the future uh, but this paper is quite excellent a few of you have requests about specific topics Uh, for videos and thank you for all those ideas uh, i'll definitely try to cover all of them uh, but the videos that i am planning to cover for the next 2 or 3 weeks are these so first next weekend i'm planning to create videos about uh, these two cs papers google file system and map reduce these are the two papers using which hadoop was created which is a distributed file system and a batch processing system or a big data processing system uh, the next one is spring security basics it's not my favorite topic uh, but i guess i finally found an uh, article using which i can create a video about it so uh, expect that to come out soon my recent interest is in uh, serverless and event driven architecture java is typically not a language which is quite popular in the serverless world uh, but a lot of changes are being made behind the scenes like new frameworks are coming out like micronaut and so i'm planning to create videos about that in next couple of weeks so, and last but not the least uh, in fact quite the opposite many of you just not in this ama but even in the comments of my videos have encouraged me to keep going and keep creating new content so thank you so much for that hearty support that you have given me and hopefully i can create a lot more content which is quite helpful for everyone so Thanks a lot for watching and see you in the next one. Bye.